Well, we're offering um, information on um, visitation to prisons, um, what to bring uh, to a prison, transportation, um, resources that have been cut off. They cut all of the free buses out that travel once a month for people to see their loved ones from New York all the way to Albany, Syracuse, Buffalo. That was cut out in 2011, okay? So now people who don't have a car, they can't visit their loved ones. And the research reflects that when families are visited more and supported, when they come home, recidivism is lower than people who don't have any support, you know, and that don't have, you know, anyone to visit them in prison, you know, when they're there. So we want to do some things like budgeting, helping them do more budgets, helping them eat healthier, as you've seen there, so that, you know, and helping them learn about public markets so that foods are, you know, that uh, foods are cheaper there than, you know, helping them get transportation so that they don't have to buy foods from um, the corner stores and so that they can go to supermarkets outside of their communities to shop and save money. This is Hello Neighbor, and this is a recipe book for um, Hispanic and African American communities to eat healthier. There are foods that they like without the fat in it, okay, without the sugar, yeah. you know, so it's like they got the, the baked pork chops instead of fried, and, you know, and breakfast sausage and Caribbean rice. Yeah, yeah, it's really, it's really a good book. And you don't put all the stuff that you know, the, the, the fat and stuff that we love so much. <laughs> I'm excited about it because it's a resource that families need in this community who have um, loved ones in the New York State um, prison system and also at the Monroe County Jail and um, the city lockup. And um, I think um, what uh, my challenge is is to provide them not only with resources that will help them um, negotiate and sort of navigate the prison system, but also referrals that will help them um, improve the lifestyle about how to um, negotiate um, mental health and um, substance abuse treatment if they need it, and um, how to advocate for support, you know, to keep their lives on track. What has changed since the collapse of Jim Crow has less to do with the basic structure of our society than the language we use to justify it. In the era of colorblindness, it is no longer socially permissible to use race explicitly as a justification for discrimination, exclusion, and social contempt. So we don't. Rather than rely on race, we use our criminal justice system to label people of color criminals and then engage in all the practices we supposedly left behind. Today, it is perfectly legal to discriminate against criminals in nearly all the ways it was once legal to discriminate against African Americans. Once you're labeled a felon, all the old forms of discrimination, housing discrimination, employment discrimination, denial of the right to vote, exclusion from jury service, are suddenly legal. As a criminal, you scarcely have more rights and arguably less respect than a black man living in Alabama at the height of Jim Crow. We have not ended racial caste in America. We have merely redesigned it. I just really, uh, really didn't have a clear understanding of what was really happening. I thought that myself and other people were just made bad choices for mistakes or whatever. And then when I really realized that a white boy's prank is a black boy's felony in the criminal justice system. It really is. It really is. Disproportionately, people of color and poor white people are incarcerated. And it's so interesting to really realize about a racial caste system that white supremacists created over and over again, you know. And that, um, you know, they are very um, clever and manipulative with that process that they use to, you know, um, build more prisons and, you know, and the public is crying out, uh, incarcerate them, you know, and it's no, it's no, it's no secret that crack had a devastating mm -hmm. impact on our communities. Mm -hmm. But when the war on drugs was launched, 
the uh, drug statistics had lowered, okay, and then, you know, um, with the program cuts and uh, the, the unemployment and a lot of other things, and everybody started to sell, um, a lot of people um, started to sell crack. Now, we can say that that's a bad decision, and we won't, uh, we won't um, have a lot of people that, 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 that won't agree with us. It's mm -hmm. a bad decision. But um, it's 30 years now, 30 years, and the war on drugs has not improved drug addiction, it has not improved uh, incarceration, it has not improved the economy, and so much money is spent on incarceration, and we're talking about um, tying in uh, us resources, you know, to uh, build our economy with jobs, and you know, the more jobs we have, you know, the more we spend and stuff like that. And if we, now Andrew Davis wants to abolish prisons, okay? And, um, you know, uh, when I heard that, I was like, okay, you know, I'm, you know, and I know people are going to say, wow, you know, she didn't used to feel like that. But I just feel like, you know, uh, because of what I learned, it's just that I never knew that they incarcerated people after emancipation just walking down the streets because they didn't have a job. And they didn't have a job because they were not educated. They didn't have skills. There certainly weren't any vocational and educational programs. I don't believe in the reform of the prison as an institution. I believe it needs to be abolished. Which is not to say, which is not to say that conditions should not change within existing prisons because there are over two million people who live um, horrendous lives. Conditions need to, to, to change, but not for the purpose of reforming the institution, but for the purpose of providing more humane con conditions of habitation for the people who have been so unfortunate as to uh, live out the most, sometimes the most important years of their lives in prison. Now, prison abolition, um, that's controversial, is it? Is that controversial? Okay, all right. I wish that um, we would um, have some alternatives that they talked about on visions of abolition mm -hmm. so that we can um, build on that, you know, because this is, a, you know, this is, you have to resist this in order to, you know, and, and I, we, we just really succumb to it because we don't know any better. People are not afforded a welcoming, um, wide circle that our community invites them into. It's very difficult to um, um, stay out of prison. It's very difficult not to go back to the old ways when you don't have a job, and you don't have a house, and you don't have a prescription for mental health um, medication that you need. Um, a lot of people who have mental health problems have numbed themselves for years with uh, illegal prescriptions and illegal street drugs. So what we're trying to do is link them to services that provide them the care for successful and reentry. Now, I work with the SMART, I work with the Prison Advisory Committee that's part of our Episcopalian Church. Um, on the diocese. I, I work with um, um, Step by Step um, for Women, Jennifer House. Um, we work with a lot of different organizations to, you know, foster uh, an alliance and um, providing services for just not women but, but um, their families. I want to um, have them have the determination, the self-determination to foster their own resilience, because we can't give people that, you know. We can help them tap within their resiliency and their empowerment, you know, but they have to have opportunities, they have to have resources, and they have to have money, you know, to live, you know. We fear to fight for liberty, we fear to fight for justice, we fear to fight for happiness, we always get risen to fear, we no one die, we no one wound, we no one quit. We no one go, I get one child, my ma different house, my pa different house, I won't build a house, I don't build a house, I no one quench, I won't enjoy, I no one go. Uh. We're 
We're going to be open um, first on Wednesdays from 3.30 to 5. And then we want to expand because we're going to get a lot of people. There's about 2,500 to 3,500 people that are released to families in this county, Monroe County, uh, yearly. We need volunteers and they can um, reach us at St. Stephen's and um, that number is 585-328-0856 um, and you can also email us at turning points for like the number four, uh, turning points for families at frontier.net. That is why everybody run, run, run. Everybody scatter, scatter. Some people lost some bed, someone nearly died. Police, they come, I mean, they come. Confusion everywhere. Ah, that's so. Time when they go. Time to wait for nobody.